welcome back to all those who are joining us the second, third, or fourth time. Um, let me first start off and introduce our agency. At Applied ABC, we offer ADA services for children on the spectrum or with autism spectrum disorder. Um, children that are diagnosed can get services through our agency. They can get between 15 to 25 hours of ABA services. Each case is assigned to a BCBA, which is a board certified behavior analyst. She supervises the case, assigns the goals, and then trains the ABA aide who works with the child. So if you know of anyone that needs services, you can always recommend our agency, apply to ABC. And if you have any questions, I'll be around. You can ask me or Gitti will be here soon. Now for tonight's workshop, which will be on advocating for services, we are very lucky and privileged to have tonight here Joan Harrington, who is the founder of Ease Services, which is Educational Advocacy Services. She has been in the field for what, over 20 years? Advocate, much more. Right. Much more than that. For a long time. Yes, for a long time, advocating for services for children, educational services, whoever needs help to be placed, and something that we need help with the Board of Ed in New York State, she's the one to turn to. And we have here tonight Pamela Kazla, who is also an ed educational advocate for services. So let's welcome Joan Harrington and Penn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Tonight we're going to talk about how to obtain services from the Department of Education for your children. The first thing I'd like to discuss is that the Board of Education is required by federal law, the IDEIA, the Individuals with Disability Education Improvement Act, to provide services to your children. I know that parents often tell me that when they're sitting at a CSC meeting, they often feel like it's being done as a favor or it's like it's coming out of someone's pocket. That's not the case. There is funding that comes from the federal government through the states to the city. And the services that your child, that you're asking for your child, you're entitled to if your child is identified as a child with a disability. However, what you're not entitled to is the best services. Anybody that uses the word best any place at a CSE meeting or anything will be told that that's not it. You are entitled to an appropriate special education for your child. You may want the very best, but unfortunately the law doesn't guarantee you to the best. Parents often get into, how should I say, difficulty with the Board of Ed when they say they want the best. because. You're just not entitled to it. What you are entitled to is an education that maximizes your child's potential. And for each one of your child, that's different. Maybe you're entitled to special education itinerant teacher services. Maybe you're ent entitled to a special class. Maybe you're entitled to a special school. The key here is what maximizes their child's potential. There is nothing in the law that is written for everybody. It is each individual child's needs. You may need something very special. Someone here talked to me about needing a nurse. That is the service that child requires in order to receive an appropriate education. So you need to keep in mind anytime you're at a meeting that it is appropriate not best that you're asking for, but that doesn't mean that you're getting nothing. It has to maximize your child's potential. Now we'll talk a little about the Committee on Preschool Special Education. The Committee on Preschool Special Education addresses issues for children before, between the ages of 2.9 and 5. Preschoolers, students aging out of early intervention services. The Committee on Preschool Special Education does not have an evaluation um, attached to them, as the CSEs have teams and psychologists. The Committee on Preschool Special Education outsources the evaluation for the children, and you get a choice of what agency you would like to have your child evaluated by. Typically speaking, younger children can receive 
more services than children that are five years old. And younger children's services can address the whole child, as opposed to when a child is five years old, that child is um, a being, you're addressing their academic needs. You're not as addressing social and behavioral needs. For 2.9 to five years old, you can get SEED services. Your child can sit in a regular program and you can provide SEED services. You can keep your child at home and you can get services at home if that's what you like. People can get up to 25 hours of services. Now, the CPSE administrators may not be willing to give that to you, certainly to start with, but those are things that you're entitled to if you have a child who is a preschooler with a disability. A child between the ages of 2.9 and 5 is not a child who will be classified. The classification is preschooler with a disability, not a learning disability, not speech and language impaired. They are identified only as preschool children with a disability. And that's important because this way they're not labeled at such a young age and we give them time to develop and to see where they're going. If your child is between the ages of 3.5, you can refer your child yourself to the administrator, the CPSC administrator in your district. You can write a letter, you can call them on the phone. They're, for the most part, very accessible, very anxious to help, and will provide you with all of the information you need. Someone else could refer the child, but nothing could happen unless you um, consent. Also, children who are receiving early intervention services, there is a flow from early intervention to the Committee on Preschool Special Education. For a child, uh, for a preschool child with a disability who is entitled to services, they will also have an IEP available to them and uh, developed to meet their unique educational needs. The services available are listed here. Related services, they, special education itinerant teacher services, an integrated class, if that's what you'd like, a special class, full or part-time, and home programs, depending upon what you prefer to be for your child. If your child is evaluated by the preschool or Committee on Preschool Special Education and you decide that you don't want to avail yourself of services, you can decline those services. What about school age special education? Children who are five years old are entitled to be evaluated, to find out, to determine if they have special education needs. If they are receiving preschool services, they will also, there will be an automatic flow to the Committee on Special Education and the child will be reviewed, may be evaluated and recommended for services. And or you at any time in your child's education career, if you determine that you want your child evaluated, you may refer your child to the committee. And you do that by putting a letter in writing to the Committee on Special Education in the district in which the child attends school. Now that's very different. Preschool children go to their home district. School age children belong to the district of service. So if you're going to a school in a district other than your home, you're referred to the committee in that school. Your letter to the committee should always be in writing and should always go registered mail so that you have proof because there are timelines. They can't wait two years to give you services for your child. They have a timeline for an initial case, which is 70 working school days. However, you have no proof of that unless you send something in writing. Okay, and you should just take your little receipt that you get from the post office and put it away. In most cases, you won't need it because they will reach out to you before. They will ask for your written consent. They will also ask for any information that you have about your child. And now you can determine what you would like to give them. At that point, the committee will evaluate your child or you can provide them with evaluation that you have. And if those evaluations are current, they may accept them. 
at some point, whether you've provided evaluations, whether they've provided the evaluation, there will be a discussion on what evaluations. Do you want a speech evaluation? Do you want an OT evaluation? Do you want a PT evaluation? If you want OT and PT, you have to give them a letter, a medical letter, like on a, a prescription pad, saying that the child can have that evaluation from their doctor. If you want speech and language evaluation, you should request that of the committee. You have a right to request that of them. If you need something else, if there's a need for a medical, and all children are supposed to present the committee with a current medical, which is a well health form, if you can't, if someone can't, then it's the committee's <coughs> responsibility to arrange for that. At the end of the evaluation, there will be a CSE meeting and an IEP or an IESP will be developed for your child. Now, here is where there is a difficulty. They call you up on the phone or they invite you to the meeting and they say to you, you're going to keep your child in yeshiva, right? You say yes and they make an IESP. But maybe you're going to keep your child in a special ed yeshiva, depending upon your child's needs. Once you have an IESP, you are saying that you are responsible for the program. You're responsible for finding a program for your child. You're responsible for choosing that program. You're responsible for paying for that program. Each one of these cases are individual. I would say that it is important, if you're considering an IESP, to talk to a professional to determine if by doing that you are taking the de Department of Education off the hook to pay for services or to pay for um, education. An IEP always entitles you to an appropriate education. An IESP simplifies the process if you want to keep your child in a private school. That private school could be a, relig a religious school or a, uh, a just a private school that's a non-sectarian. However, it's, it does simplify the method by which you get services, but you are giving up a lot of rights, and you shouldn't do that unless you, dis unless you talk to someone who understands that process. This is an IESP. Okay, that's an IEP. An IESP will say that right there. You can... Even at, let's say you wind up at a meeting and you get handed an IESP. I don't want an IESP, I want an IEP. You just give it right back to them and make it clear. But this is an IEP. Okay. An IEP is the document, they'll have your child's name, they'll have your child's birth date, they'll have their New York City ID number, they'll have at this point the disability classification, and there is a wide variety of classifications a child can be learning disabled, multiply disabled, speech and language disabled, other health impaired. Now that's important. Children who have a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder, the appropriate classification for that child is not emotionally disturbed, it is um, other health impaired. And that's important. That's been, a lot of people have fought very hard for that to happen. So if you have a child that has a, um, an ADHD or an ADD diagnosis, their classification should be other health impaired. Now, in the first paragraph, they're supposed to talk about evaluation results. Okay? And that is supposed to be filled out. That is about the child. It, can be, it should be filled out from an evaluation. And that evaluation that is quoted here should not be more than three years from the date of the review meeting. They can't use something from five years ago. It really should be as current as it can get so that you can discuss. For children who are getting IESPs, they tend not to do the evaluations often. But you want them to have the most current information so that they can make the most appropriate placement. Now, the levels of knowledge and development, these all need to be filled in. This part should be, the information should come from teachers' reports 
and the participation of the child's special education teacher and or related service provider at the meeting. If they're not at the meeting, this IEP is really not appropriate because we have no current information about what the child needs. We have an evaluation, but the process is built in a way so that in addition to an evaluation, you get information about how the child functions in the classroom. Both pieces are necessary before you can make a recommendation for the child. The child's social development, the student's strengths, I like when I see IEPs that say none, okay? Every child has strengths, okay. every child, okay? And you should make sure that your child's strengths are here. It, they have to be there. It's part of what you need to know. Their social development, that comes from you and from the teacher in the school because it's both of you that can talk about what the child needs socially. Then this is the physical development. Now this is important also if your child has physical challenges, whatever they may be. This is the second of the uh, section of the IEP where this should be, okay? A true, accurate description of the child's physical development. And their strengths again. Something has to be there, it can't say none. It's supposed to be your and the teacher's description of what their strengths are. Okay. Can we move it on? Is it possible? Okay. Management needs. This is kind of important. What kind of material resources and or services does the child need to be managed in the classroom? A health paraprofessional? Occupational therapy? Read and reread? Small group instruction? I can tell you that. This is really something for the teacher and the parent to talk about. And that's why it's so important and critical that a teacher be present at the meeting. This is a, this is a part of the IEP that talks about mainstreaming and the effect of the student's needs on their involvement in general education. Children are supposed to be as close to the mainstream as possible and involved in general education and general education curriculum where appropriate for the child. And this is an important section of the IEP. The students, the students needs relating to special factors. Does a child hard of hearing? Do they need an FM unit? Do they need an oral transliterator? Is the child deaf? and do they need someone to help them with signing? Is the child blind? Do they need braille? Is the child physically challenged? Do they need a para? Do they need technology in order to help them access the curriculum in the classroom? This, again, you as the parent, you as the teacher, have to make sure that you're heard. You should be heard even if they don't put it on the IEP. It's important for you to be heard. If they ignore what you say, that's for someone else to deal with at another point. But as the professionals and the parent, you should be heard and it should be put there. Now, it says, does the student need a particular device or service to address their communication needs? Yes, no. A lot of children do. If they do, it needs to be here. Okay. If they say to you at the meeting, we don't know, and maybe your child does need technology, but you need to request that, you do it right there at the meeting. Even if you have to stop the meeting, and take a pencil, and write out, I want a technology evaluation. Happens to be that one of the things the New York City Department of Education does very well is technology evaluations. They are very knowledgeable. They can provide augmentative communication devices. They can provide iPads. They provide computers. They provide laptops. They provide a variety of things. They have software for the kids. They can make it very 
uh, they can make it easier for the child to access the curriculum. There's a, station, there's a statement that says, if your child needs a technology advice, does the committee recommend that the advice be used in the student's home? In most cases, you want it used in the home. It makes no good use to anybody if you leave it in school, whatever it is. Okay? There are children that have no language. They have these little wallets with, with the cards where they pull them out and they show you. What good is it in school? The child needs to be able to express himself at home. In most cases, you want it at home. This is really for older children, post-secondary goals and transition needs. As children get older, the Board of Ed and the parents want to plan, plan for their future. You want to plan for what's going to happen when they get older. And transition needs are an important piece of an IEP for a child <coughs> over 14 years old. You might want to have vocational goals. You might want to have some special vocational training. You might want to have some special evaluations to determine their needs. So this is not for younger children, but it's really important for older. Are high schools are mandated to give those evaluations? Yes, they are. And it's mandated to have it on this IEP, too. This is all annual goals. I'm not going to say a lot about that, but I'm going to say that what's on page one and two of the IEP, which is the description of the child and their strengths and their weaknesses and their needs, should be translated into annual goals for the children. The more children that have more needs also get um, short-term goals because they need to learn in a different way. The goals are supposed to be reflective of the child's needs. The goals are supposed to be individualized to the child. The goals are also supposed to be challenging. You're not supposed to make it just so easy. They're supposed to be sufficiently challenging so that the child is learning. Depending on the child, each one has, you know, each goal is different. There is supposed to be goals in each area. There are supposed to be education goals, counseling goals, OT goals, PT goals, speech goals. If the child has a one-to-one -one paraprofessional, which we'll talk about in a minute, there are supposed to be goals for the paraprofessional. Here it is, it, these are the annual goals. These are the short-term instructional objectives for students who have more um, special education needs. Could we, and then they're gonna, here's it. Special education program recommendation. Special class, general education. If your child has an IEP, general education with related services is the child's special education placement. The child's special education placement is in a general education class with OT, PT, para, whatever the services are. The related services. Now, I don't know if any of you have had the um, opportunity to sit at a CSE meeting when the CSE tells you that they're only allowed to give you two times of speech or one time of this mm -hmm. or two. No such thing, okay? Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can assure you in the law that says they can do that, and there's nothing that is defensible. The children get the services they need to maximize their potential. That can be one time a week of speech or five times a week of speech. It can be 30 minutes or it can be 60 minutes. It can be five times a week of PT. It can be what the child needs. OT, PT, speech, and counseling. Parents can go to impartial hearings on their own. I'm not in any way telling you that you can't. But if you're looking for money or services or reimbursement for services or money, it's probably not a wise thing to do because you may not be experienced. Whatever you're going to a hearing about, you should probably consult with one of the people that do the work, even if you ultimately decide not to hire that person, but to go on your own. Because it's a process unto itself. It's a legal process. It's not, and it doesn't have to be an unfriendly process for parents, but it very much can be. And if you go to a hearing, by yourself, let's just say asking for a para, and you lose, 
you cannot ask for that again until the following school year because you can only ask once a year at a hearing for one thing. You can go to nine hearings for nine different issues, but if you lose, you can't ask for the same thing over and over again. So if it's important to you, you should certainly consult with someone before going to a hearing. Thank you everyone here for joining us tonight. Yes, I just want to thank you so much.